Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. Uh, today's pre-class video is finishing off chapter 7 of Wolfson. And the three remaining sections are uh, non-conservative forces, conservation of energy, and potential energy curves. And you see the quote above is, what friction and other non-conservative forces do is convert the kinetic energy of macroscopic objects, things that are moving through space, into the kinetic energy and even the potential energy associated with the random motions uh, of individual molecules and the bonds between them. So it's all this energy stuff again. And, and actually, before we get going with, uh, with um, non-conservative forces, I wanted to do uh, an, an exercise for you, an example of an end of chapter problem that uses conservation of mechanical energy just to show you that this energy stuff is all designed to make your life easier. Let's work through exercise 21 from chapter 7. A 120 gram arrow is shot vertically from a bow, so let's write down the mass there, 120 grams, uh, convert it to uh, kilograms. A uh, bow whose effective spring constant is 430 newtons per meter. If the bow is drawn 71 centimeters before shooting, so let's say x is 71 centimeters or 0.71 meters, to what height does the arrow rise? Okay, so we're here, we're trying to find the height when the final velocity, let's call it v2, is equal to zero. Okay, so I know that this is chapter 7, and this must be a conservation of energy problem. But let's, uh, just for fun, try to use forces. Will a forces method work here? Well, we have to start by drawing a free body diagram for the arrow while it's on the bow. So uh, the bow is stretched downwards. So we call the equilibrium of the bow y equilibrium. Uh, it's stretched down a distance x, so the x is equal to y equilibrium minus y, where y is the height off the ground. So the force of the spring, kx, upwards, will be k times x y equilibrium minus y. So there's the free body diagram. There's a spring force up. There's the mg down. Uh, so the net force, which is m times a sub y, in the y direction is k, uh, y e x minus y minus mg. We can solve that for a sub y, which is d squared y by dt squared. It's negative k over my plus this, these other constants. So, uh, so can we solve this? Well, yeah, we can. This is called uh, what's called a second order linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. Um, that's actually not as hard as it sounds to solve. It's cosine is the solution. Uh, we will get to that later in the course, but. Don't forget the arrow is still on the bow, right? And you have to find when it leaves the bow and then becomes a projectile and goes up to the top of its path. Uh, so anyway, the point here is basically this is not the easiest way to solve this problem. Uh, you can do it, but better to just use conservation of energy. We're in chapter seven, so let's do it. Um, Let's uh, set up before and after. We'll call before when the arrow is pulled all the way down, just before it is released up into the air. So we can draw that out. Uh, there's the little arrow. Its initial speed is actually zero when you just before you release it. Uh, we know that it's stretched down 0.71 meters. We can define that to be the bottom, y1 equals zero. So E1, which is the initial mechanical energy of the arrow, is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So kinetic is 1 half mv1 squared. Uh, potential has two parts, mgy and 1 half kx squared for the gravitational and elastic. So v1 is 0 and y1 is 0. So those two uh, parts of the energy are 0. And so the initial total mechanical energy is just 1 half kx1 squared. So that's the initial. Let's look at the final energy now. So uh, at the top of the path is where we're trying to find the, b the arrow, so we can see it going up to the top of its path, v2 equals zero, that defines the top of the path, y2 would be the height that it reaches, this is what we're trying to find, and if you think about the bow, the bow is released, meaning that there's no more uh, elastic potential energy in the bow, so we say there that x2 equals zero, meaning that the bow is now at its equilibrium position. Okay, so we can write down now e2, the final energy, this is going to be the sum of k2 plus u2, the final kinetic and potential. So 1 half mv2 squared plus uh, mgy2 plus 
1 half k x2 squared. Uh, so v2, final speed is 0. Uh, also x2 is 0 as we discussed. So final energy is just mg times y2. Okay, so now we just apply conservation of mechanical energy. Uh, and we're assuming here that uh, there's no uh, loss due to air resistance. So E1 equals E2. That's our equation. Uh, we got, got those 1 half k x1 squared equals mg y2. And now we just solve for y2. So it's pretty simple. Just rearrange y2 is k x1 squared over 2 mg. We can plug in all the numbers we have uh, in SI units, of course. Plugging that all into my calculator, I got 92.16, so that rounds to 92 meters. And just remember that this is above the arrow's lowest point when it was stretched. So uh, there's an extra 71 centimeters there um, if you wanted. I guess you could subtract the 71 centimeters if you wanted to find the position above the arrow's equilibrium position. And that's it. Okay, so next up is the section on non-conservative forces. So remember, a conservative force is a force like gravity or a spring force that gives back the energy that was transferred by doing work. So if you reverse the process, you get all that energy back. And if you uh, go in a closed path, the work done by the conservative force is always zero. So there's a, always a potential energy associated with position. So a non-conservative force is something that doesn't do that, and it usually involves either sort of the loss of some energy to thermal processes or the, or the burning of some chemical energy. So we'll do two examples. One is that, uh, let's say we've got a, a block that is up against a spring that's attached to the wall. This spring is initially compressed, so it contains a lot of potential energy. Then the block is sprung forward, it's released, uh, it's, so it's going really fast. It slides then along a force, uh, a floor that has some friction. So there's a kinetic friction force uh, acting opposite to the motion which slows this block down and keeps slowing down until it stops. So if you look at the energy bar graphs of kinetic and potential energy, uh, this system starts with a lot of potential energy, zero kinetic. Then the mass is launched and so that flips all that spring potential energy, gets converted to kinetic energy, so the mass is moving along. And then as the mass moves along, it stops. So the spring doesn't gain any energy, it just stays at zero, but the kinetic energy drops down to zero. So, so that's a, due to the non-conservative force of kinetic friction. So what we do there is we add, uh, it's actually thermal energy that's being created here. So uh, little microscopic random motions uh, of the particles in the floor and also the bottom of the box. It's, it's creating heat, right? So it's heating up. And so there's some internal energy that starts off at zero, and then as the box slows down, the internal energy grows and grows. So that, once again, if you add up all of these uh, boxes, they always end up the same. So we say that energy is conserved if you include this internal thermal energy. Another example, let's talk about a car. So a car starts at a stop sign. Uh, it's got zero kinetic energy, and then the driver stops, steps on the gas, speeds up, and keeps speeding up. And here again, if we look at the uh, kinetic and potential energy, there's, there's no potential energy uh, because the car is at zero height. And so what just happens is the kinetic energy grows and grows. So how can that be? Well, this is a non-conservative force of the engine uh, which is involved here. And so if we <laughs> put some bar graphs of internal energy, this might be like the internal chemical energy that's in the gasoline in the tank of the car. It's some huge amount of joules and as the car is driving it's using up gas right it's burning that fuel which is actually creating heat which is uh, creating pressure inside the pistons the pistons are, pr are pushing on on the uh, on something that's connected to the axle making these wheels rotate and then you know the static friction force is constraining the the car to move to accelerate forwards but there's some internal energy in the gas tank which is decreasing as the kinetic energy of the car increases and so once again uh, energy is conserved in this process and uh, but you can't go back right if you if you drive your car backwards it doesn't fill up the tank right so this is this is uh, internal energy is, is a one-way process so so again it's a non-conservative force okay so the big idea of chapter six and seven is pretty much uh, in this equation above its equation 7.8 from your text on page uh, 120 
Um, and it's saying, so the left hand side of the equation is the change in the total energy of the system. The right hand side of the equation is the external work, so the work done by external forces. So what you're doing is you're defining a system, maybe it's this cart, including the, the gravitational interaction. Um, you can change the energy of the system if somebody from the outside, like my hand or something, uh, pushes the cart, for example. That will change the total energy. And as far as the total energy, well, there's three components. There's the change in uh, the kinetic energy, so it could be speeding up or slowing down. There's the change in the potential energy, so it could be going up the hill or down the hill, or you know, there could be a spring involved, which is stretching or, or, um, or compressing. Uh, and then the, the last one there is a delta E internal, so the change in thermal energy. So sometimes uh, there could be some heat generated by friction in the, in the wheels or something like that. So the total change in all this energy is equal to the work of, of external forces. And if there is no external forces um, doing work on the system, then uh, the change in the total energy equals zero. And that's often what happens in these problems, and that's how you, how you solve, uh, solve a uh, a mechanics problem is that you set the change in the total energy equal to zero. Okay, so the next uh, is about potential energy curves. And what is shown here to start this chapter is, uh, or to start this section, is a roller coaster. And what you imagine is that you've got uh, a roller coaster. The cars here um, are, are moving without any friction and they don't have any engine on them or something, so they're just coasting along, speeding up as they go down, slowing down as, as they go up. And it says, how fast must a car be coasting at point A if it's to, uh, to reach point D? So it starts here, it's going down with some speed. It has enough speed so that it gets over the first hill and it gets over the second hill. And so it's got some energy here, EA. Uh, it's going to slow down uh, when the most when its potential energy is the highest. So we can set uh, Vc here equals to zero and that will be the minimum speed. So I would just say here minimum speed will be when uh, V sub C equals zero. So you set E sub A equals E sub C. That's your conservation of energy. This is going to be one half mVA squared uh, plus mg uh, H A uh, equals this uh, zero um, plus M G H C, and you can solve that off for V sub A is equal to the square root of two times G times H sub C minus H sub A. That's going to be the minimum speed. Okay, so uh, here's some other potential energy curves. So this height now is representing this U, potential energy of, of, a, of a force or, or something that's, that's uh, the potential energy of a, of a system, a car. So if the total energy of the car is E1 here, then that's high enough so that it has, can have kinetic energy anywhere. And so it can move anywhere in this, in the gra on this uh, x-axis. However, if the total energy is less now, we get to a point where kinetic energy cannot be negative, right? So it gets up to here, and then the kinetic energy goes to zero. And at this point, there's a force that's returning it. So uh, what will happen is that if, if it starts here, it'll go down, uh, up the hill, it'll go up to its maximum point here, and it'll actually turn around. So these two points are called the turnaround points. If it, if it oscillates back here, it'll go up again, get to uh, zero kinetic energy at this point, and then go back and forth. So it'll sort of oscillate around this whole curve. If you lower the energy again and start it here to E3, now it can't get over uh, this point B. It's confined to this region right here, and it'll just oscillate back and forth right in here. So this figure shows the potential energy of a system which is two hydrogen atoms in a hydrogen molecule. So the energy here as associated with the attractive and repulsive electrical forces uh, involving the electrons and the nuclei of the two atoms. So, and there's a potential well here at the bottom, uh, and that's called a bound system. So, uh, the minimum energy corresponds to the molecular equilibrium separation right here of 0 0.074 nanometers, and 
the way we usually define the zero of the potential energy is we say it's where the atoms are infinitely far apart. Okay, so all the actual energy here uh, of the system is negative, meaning that the, um, the molecule is bound. Okay, so the last thing in chapter seven is finding force from potential energy. So again, go back to that car on the roller coaster. Notice that if it's going up the hill here, then the, the force on it, the net force, is to the left, uh, if, which if it's going to the right is slowing it down. If, it's, um, if this potential energy is decreasing, then the net force is to the right. So the force in the x direction turns out to be the negative of the slope of the potential energy curve. So d by dx of u um, is the slope of this curve. The, if it's a positive slope, that means that the force is negative. If it's a negative slope, it means the force is positive. And it turns out that the, uh, that the spatial derivative of potential energy gives you a force. And that is it for chapter seven. I will see you in class.